This is episode 71 of the Real World Wellness Podcast. Hi everyone, I'm Christine Lehman, a nutritional therapy practitioner and reverse diabetes coach, which is also the name of my website. I see clients in person and remotely, and I'm accepting a limited number of clients right now. You can reach me on my contact form, or you can just email me directly at christine at reversediabetescoach.com. Please remember while you're listening to the show, advice and information we provide is intended to be helpful and informative, but is not a substitute for medical advice or treatment. I am delighted to welcome back my frequent co-host and certified nutrition specialist and nutritional therapist, Amy Berger, back to the show. Amy has recently... <laughs> Amy has researched and written about High Intensity Interval Training, or HIIT, which is the focus of today's episode. So Amy, can you go ahead and set the stage for the research that we're going to talk about and maybe explain just what is HIIT? Sure. Um, so this type of training is, like you said, high intensity interval training. And there's two aspects to that. There's the high intensity and there's the interval training. So um, I'll go backwards and I'll start by talking about intervals. Intervals are um, where you perform some type of activity for some period of time and then either take a, and then take a break or do it a little less intensely. So for example, if you were on a bicycle or a stationary bike, you might pedal for, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds or even 15 seconds, whatever time interval you choose, then you have another period of time where you take a break, where you're either not pedaling at all or you're pedaling much slower. The, um, the high intensity part of that comes when the intervals when you are performing the activity, you're going all out. You're going at a high intensity. Um, and of course, that's relative, right? Um, depending on what kind of shape you're in or depending on, you know, a lot of other factors, one person's level 10 all out maximum effort could be somebody else's level two or three. So that's, that's a relative thing. And um, so the, the high intensity, you know, some people will say, I did high intensity interval training for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. And it's kind of a little bit not true because if you're really truly doing the high intensity, you can't keep that up for 30 or 45 minutes. So again, that's that's still relative. It depends on each individual's level of conditioning and fitness. But um, the high intensity part is something that you should not be able to keep up for an extended period of time, even when you're taking the interval breaks. Um, There's really no amount of time that is the maximum you should be able to keep it up for. But, you know, when somebody says, I did did high intensity intervals for 30 or 40 minutes, it's kind of like, well, it might have been a a tough effort, but it probably wasn't your highest maximal output intensity. Mm -hmm. Um, But... So you really have to kind of push yourself, is is that correct, to do so? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like if you if you can carry on a conversation, or if you're able, if you're on the bike or the elliptical machine or something, and you're able to keep reading your book or looking at your smartphone, you're probably not working out at as high an intensity as you think you are. And that's not. I mean, I'm not trying to insult anybody. I'm just trying to, you know, keep this keep this real. Um, that you really have to be going all out. Mm-hmm. And I think some of those machines uh, register kind of the heart rate and so on, and so, and they categorize it, like you were saying earlier, maximum, you know, heart rate is X level, for example, so if you can even use those kind of guides on the machines, perhaps? Yeah, I, mean, I think you said the magic word, they're guides. I mean, I... How accurate are those measurements? I don't know. You know, when you grab onto the handles of a machine and right. it tells you your heart rate, I'm not sure how accurate that is, but it is a guide. I mean, it probably gives you a good ballpark. And um, it's really subjective. I mean, if you think you're going all out, you could not possibly be working harder than you are at your maximum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, it is very relative because, you know, my, my maximum running speed is going to be very different from an Olympic sprinter's maximum running speed, but 
it's still my maximum. Sure. So um, the standard for public health and, and public health recommendations has been what I think of as a steady state. In other words, or this continuous exercise at longer sessions. So for example, the CDC has recommended on average 150 minutes week, which translates roughly to three 50-minute sessions. And I think the main point being continuous exercise. So that really is kind of contradictory or different than what we're talking about. Right. The high-intensity stuff is usually performed for a much shorter period of time. Um, and I think, you know, you and I would probably both agree that for the for the majority of people just looking to get healthy and sort of maintain a baseline of wellness, any type of activity is better than none. You know, um, any activity that you like doing is the one you should do. If you like being on the bike for an hour or being on the treadmill for 40 minutes, you know, that's, I think that's okay. Like, it's not, they're just different methods. And I, I do think that any kind of exercise is better than none. And if, if you have a specific goal, a specific physique goal, or maybe a weight loss goal, then there might be, you know, specific strategies that are better than others. But for the purpose of just a baseline level of wellness, I think just being active is, is key, regardless of how you choose to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, also, I just want to point out that it sounds like this HIIT method can be done on a variety of equipment, like cycles or treadmills. Right, correct. Yeah. Most of the research, for some reason, is done on stationary bikes, and I think that's probably just because it's a convenient way to do it in a laboratory setting, but mm -hmm. you can do it on a treadmill, you can do it on a rower, you can do it um, on an elliptical machine, and you can do it without any equipment at all. I mean, the, the rationale behind, behind the high-intensity intervals is just to do something at a high intensity. That could even be jumping jacks, running in place, push-ups, you know, as long as you are pushing yourself to your limit, then whatever, you know, whatever movement you're doing could be done at a high intensity. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and even jump roping. I just thought right, of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so you can do it. I like that because I'm I'm not really a gym rat at this point. So anything I can do at home or outside. Um, yeah, no, we'll we'll talk about that more too. Yeah. I think um, that's one of the benefits of this of this high intensity. Is you can do it really anywhere with no equipment. You can do it, you know, in your living room during commercial breaks and. Um, you know, and you'll still get a pretty good, pretty good benefit from that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about the research, and I thought we'd start with the master study involving young men. So can you talk about the protocol? What did the study compare? And then maybe talk about some of the findings. Sure. So there's a study out of uh, McMaster University, which I think is in Canada. Yes. And they had a cohort of young men, average age 27, average BMI 26, which I think is in the overweight category, but not obese, but they did, you know, it went, it ran the gamut. There were people that were a little smaller, people that were larger, so they, they were mostly overweight or obese. Um, habitually sedentary people with no change to their normal diet. And the protocol for these guys was three times a week for 12 weeks, they had one group do sprint intervals on a bike and another group do um, a moderate intensity continuous training. So the one group did, um, where is it? A, two, a total of, of a 10 minute workout, which included a two minute warm up, a three minute cool down, and 20 seconds of all out sprints on the cycle three times. So 20 seconds, three times is 60 seconds with two minutes sort of as the, as the rest interval. So during, during the 60 seconds, they were going all out and during the two minutes, they were still cycling, but at a much, much lower intensity. Mm -hmm. And compared to the moderate intensity group, they had to exercise same thing three times a week for 12 weeks, 45 minutes at 70% of their maximal heart rate with also a two minute warm up and a three minute cool down. So they were at, they were cycling for a much longer period of time but at a lower intensity. Um, and they, 
the research found pretty similar results after the 12 weeks in both of these groups. Um, both groups had pretty nice, favorable changes. Their, their fasting glucose decreased, their fasting insulin was down, um, percent body fat changed just a little bit. Um, the the GLUT4 content of the skeletal muscle increased, and, and the GLUT4 is a, a glucose transporter in the skeletal muscle that is uh, sensitive to insulin. So basically, when you exercise, it kind of makes your muscles hungry for glucose. It sucks up glucose, and that increased the ability of the muscles to do that. Um, the HOMA IR, H-O-M-A IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance, also went down. So this is pretty good. For mm-hmm. 12 weeks, considering these guys had no change to their diet, all they did was cycling. And I have to point out, because it's pretty amazing, in the sprint group, they exercised for 10 minutes, three times a week, but that 10-minute protocol was only literally 60 seconds of all-out cycling, right? Three times, 20-second intervals. One minute. Yeah. Three times a week. And they got basically the same results as people that were working out for 45 minutes three times a week. So that's kind of the beauty of the high intensity intervals. That's kind of the whole rationale behind them is that you get the same benefits and some studies show you get even better benefits in much, much less time. So for people who, you know, main roadblock to to adding exercise to their lives is they don't have time, you know, maybe they have kids and, and, you know, work overtime and there's just so many obligations, one minute a week, well, not that was one minute three times a week, sorry, but, you know, I mean, we're talking very small amounts of time that if you go really, really hard, then you may get the same benefits as somebody doing it much, much longer. Right, and I just want to add that there was a control group, uh, which did not exercise, um, and so that was the third arm of the protocol, so compared to that, both groups did better, right? Right, right, they both did better. Mm-hmm. And they both, they had, um, there's something called VO2 max, which is the volume of oxygen that you consume while you're performing exercise, and basically, um, the higher, if I'm not mistaken, the higher the VO2 max, the more physically fit you are, the better your condition you are, and both of these groups, the, the high intensity and the, um, and the moderate intensity had had significant increases in their in their oxygen consumption, which means that their cardio respiratory fitness increased over this time. Mm-hmm. Now, I referenced um, Chris Cresser's post on HIT recently, um, and he also quotes Dr. Doug McGuff, who explained that high intensity training is superior to chronic cardio because it produces a greater stimulus and thus more effectively empties the muscles and liver of glucose. And then the other interesting point is that he says the stimulus can last several days as opposed to just a few hours with low intensity training. I think um, that makes sense to me. If you've ever done the high intensity stuff, I mean, you, you definitely feel it for a longer period of time afterwards in a good way. I mean, you might feel a little bit sore, but I feel like even psychologically you feel a boost, you feel better, but um, it's interesting. Like, I I kind of always knew it lasted longer in terms of the acute sense, like a couple of hours later, but to know that it actually lasts days later is really interesting, and that's probably why they, I think they don't even really recommend to do high intensity every day. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Yeah. And, I mean, I know myself when I do more high intensity and uh, even a cardio workout because I don't always do um, the high intensity. This is kind of a shift for me. Um, But I notice that um, there's definitely my metabolism is revved up. And I, I can kind of just intuitively tell that I'm also burning more calories. Um, uh, when I expend more energy, which makes sense, right? Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, like we were saying at the beginning, <clears throat> any kind of activity is good, and I think it's, we'll, I will talk about this more in a bit, I think, but it's, it's good to do a mix in terms of, you know, you want to do some slow, you know, long duration, lower intensity, and then 
interspersed here and there throughout the week with with higher intensity, shorter bouts, because I think they do they do different things. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. certain things are good for mobility and flexibility. Certain things are better for improving. You know, like we said, the cardiovascular system. But I think it's so. I don't know. Maybe this will resonate with some listeners out there. I I exercise and I go through bouts where sometimes I really enjoy it and I look forward to it, and sometimes I have to force myself to do it. And part of that is because um, I've, I've struggled with my weight for a long time, and I used to look at exercise as a weight loss tool, right? And so mm-hmm. I would run. I mean, I've run two marathons, and in the finish line pictures of both of those marathons, I'm significantly chubby. And that just goes to prove that, as they say, you can't outrun a bad diet. Both of these marathons was before I, I was a low-carb eater and a, a more paleo eater. Um, and so exercise had always failed me as a way to change my shape and to lose weight. I've always been healthy. I've always been fit. But I was larger than you would expect from the amount of exercise I was doing. And now, years later, that I've learned a lot more about how all this works, I can see exercise as more of a tool for maintaining health and maintaining mobility and flexibility and just the ability to move around through the day to to sprint up a flight of stairs if I have to or carry something heavy. Um, mm-hmm. And so I think that. I'm probably not alone in that, that a lot of people are turned off by exercise because they've done it in the past and they feel they didn't get any benefit from it, but they were probably measuring that benefit solely through the scale or even even through the measuring tape. You know, exercise, lifting weights, I think, can really change your shape, but long, steady cardio is, it's just not the best weight loss tool, but if we can embrace exercise for its other benefits, then for me at least, it doesn't seem like a chore anymore. It's almost like something, I, I'm doing my body a favor by taking the time to, to either go to the gym or go for a walk or something like that. Absolutely. Um, and I'll share some more thoughts too on that. Um, speaking of benefits, I know insulin sensitivity improves with exercise. There's plenty of research you know, to back that up, but I was wondering why, you know, uh, the SIT group, for example, it did even better on that measure than the cardio group. And that's something that Dr. McGuff talks about. He says it more effectively empties the muscles and livers of glucose. So I just wanted to get your comments on that. Well, I mean, it, it's my understanding, and I, I could be wrong, but the high-intensity stuff is more glycolytically demanding, meaning it's powered more by glucose. So if you were doing something really high intensity, it requires more glucose than if you were walking or jogging kind of at a slow pace. That's more fueled by fat. Of course, being fueled by fat is great, but in terms of helping the body, you know, use up some of its stored glycogen, the high intensity stuff is going to do that a lot more. You can kind of just imagine that as common sense. I mean, if you think that you're just out for a Sunday stroll, you know, you're you're moving and that's great, but you're not, do you, I hate that, that phrase, feel the burn, but you know, do you feel the burn? Do you feel like you're really challenging those muscles when you're walking as opposed to if you were sprinting or doing, you know, a hop on the bike? Um, and I think that's one of the, the biggest benefits of the intense stuff is that it does, um, contribute to insulin sensitivity and, and to, you know, it could be partially that in, in empty, not emptying, I mean, our glycogen stores are never fully empty, but they may be a little bit reduced, you know, by this type of exercise, so that when you have your next meal, the carbohydrate has somewhere to go. You know, the glucose, if your muscles are hungry for the glucose and your liver is hungry for the glucose, it's got somewhere to go as opposed to just going for a slow walk and you come home and you have a big slice of bread or you know some other some other carbohydrate source that you didn't really empty any of your stored carbohydrates so now where's that going to go um and then i also think the high intensity stuff is more effective for 
mitochondrial biogenesis, and that's a big scary word that really it just means making new mitochondria in your body. That's what you know intense exercise does that. And it, I mean, I can't say the more mitochondria you have, the better, but because that's kind of too simplistic. It's more like it keeps your mitochondria in in healthy working order. Right. What is mitochondria for the lay person? Those are the little pieces inside ourselves that actually generate energy. So sometimes people call them the, the power plants of the cell or the, the energy factories. They are the, the mini organ inside ourselves that actually create the energy that we use to do everything from breathing and blinking to running. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, yeah, I think the... I think the intense stuff is, it has a lot of effects that, that the regular slow, long duration stuff doesn't have. Mm-hmm. And it would seem also that this would lead to greater fat loss or fat burning as well. I, I think it does. So, because even if, um, even if this stuff is more glucose dependent, you know, more fueled by glucose than fat, if you're burning more total calories, you're, you're, expending more total energy, then you will also expend more fat in the process. Right, you'll tap into your fat stores. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's sort of another argument um, that also Dr. McGuff makes um, is for this uh, fat burning and uh, using the glucose, and so that helps uh, the insulin sensitivity. So that sounds promising also for people with type 2 diabetes. So I was wondering. I, I, no, go ahead. No, I was wondering um, if you can comment on that as well as then lead into the study on the postmenopausal women with type two diabetes. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think. <clears throat> I think any like like we said earlier, any type of activity is going to be beneficial. And diabetics, you know, especially if if somebody's severely overweight. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that they start doing a ton of intervals. You know, they, they kind of need to ease into it, but right. they might, you know, they might do really well on a cycle or even swimming. You can do intervals through swimming because mm-hmm. um, you would want something that's kind of low impact on the joint mm-hmm. just for somebody that's, that's significantly overweight. Um, but there was, you know, let's, we'll talk about another study now because that first study was in young men, right? And like, wow, young men exercised and they got healthier, what a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, um, it does seem that women struggle a lot more than men, especially as we get older. Um, so it's, you know, postmenopausal women tend to be a group that really, really struggles with fat loss. So um, there was a study with uh, postmenopausal women with type 2 diabetes, average age 69, average BMI 31, so these, mm-hmm. these women were in the obese category, mm-hmm. and this was also a, a comparison of a group of high intensity cycling versus lower intensity, and the low intensity group did um, twice a week for 16 weeks, they did 40 minutes of cycling at 55 to 60% of their maximum heart rate, so you know, they're moving, but 55 to 60% of the max heart rate is not really an all-out effort. It's just kind of a slow, steady cycle. And um, the high-intensity group did the same uh, duration of the study, twice a week for 16 weeks. They did um, intervals of 8 seconds going uh, 77 to 85% of their max heart rate, so much, much harder cycling for eight seconds with a 12 second active recovery. An active recovery just means they were still cycling but much, much slower. Um, so a total of, of 20 minutes of that because they did six, so eight seconds of hard cycling, 12 seconds of active recovery for 60 intervals. So that's a 20 minutes. So, um, and they had, again, they had similar, similar results. You know, for doing for doing twenty minutes twice a week versus forty minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me see if I have the exact results here. Well, I can just say quickly that I think what stood out to me was this uh, significant loss of abdominal and visceral fat because visceral fat is such a risk factor for a variety of cardio 
cardiovascular diseases, metabolic conditions. Right, right. So even aside from fat and let's say their arms or legs, they lost that abdominal fat or that intra-organ fat, which, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to be much more linked to metabolic problems and, and health conditions. Um, so yeah, both, both groups of women lost weight and I think they both, they both lost body fat, but the group in the high intensity, you're right, was the one that lost the, um, the significant abdominal and visceral fat mass. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we might, we might all want to lose weight in our arms and legs and hips, but, you know, if you, it, it seems to be more metabolically beneficial to lose that sort of trunk weight, the, the, the visceral fat. Mm -hmm. And that is really important that um, people address that in, as early as possible um, to remove that risk factor. And, yeah. and, and people that are thin elsewhere can still have that intra-abdominal and intra-organ fat. I mean, that's, you know, some of, we call that tofi, thin outside, fat inside, where, you know, they look lean on the outside, but we don't know, they might have fat stored ectopically, which means, you know, inside their organs, or fat that's stored outside the normal places of fat storage. Right, and I've even um, talked to a potential client about that. Um, he was, I think, only 10 pounds um, overweight, and his doctor picked up on it during a physical and told him he needed to, you know, address that. So hopefully more doctors are, are becoming tuned into that issue as well. So it's important that people try and catch it. And, um, right. Yeah. Um, I feel like there was, oh, I wanted to stress again, because I think you and I are in agreement on this. It's interesting to note that all of these results that they've gotten, and, and these are only two examples of studies. I mean, there's many more showing similar results that either a high intensity protocol was equal to or even better than uh, a, a longer duration, slower intensity type of exercise, but most of the studies I've seen in this <clears throat> do not require the participants to change their diet at all, and it's kind of because they're trying to isolate exercise as the variable, right? They only want to change one variable so that they can say definitively the changes that happened were due to the exercise program rather than confounding or, or muddying the waters with multiple changes, like if they had changed their diet or started some kind of new supplement. So they only changed the exercise. Now, I mean, imagine what the results would have been if they had combined this exercise program with a change in diet. I mean, that's, that would have been really interesting, but I, I understand why they have to isolate the variable, but it is kind of like, wow, this, these results probably would have been, you know, stunning with, with a real change in diet. Right, because even just anecdotally, I have seen that ex that combination of exercise, regardless of the intensity. Um, and, and most of my clients, frankly, are doing more low-impact exercise because they um, are obese. Mm -hmm. and, um, but to their credit, often um, they exercise several times a week, but I would like to see them engage over time. I think starting out, definitely low impact makes sense. Um, and to work in, up to doing these kind of bursts of energy is kind of how I think about it. Um, right. And incorporating that in so they don't have to really exercise quite as uh, often or quite as much um, in duration. And, right. and that's the point. They can get the similar benefits. But going back to what you were saying about diet, I think when they're working with me, of course, we're working on kind of a paleo or primal diet in combination with the exercise. And I do find overall that those clients generally get the best results um, with a combination of strategies. Yeah, that doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. I think there's probably multiple things working there. I mean, the exercise does, of course, improve the insulin sensitivity and the glucose handling, so that's huge, especially for, for type 2 diabetics. But I think it's, it's probably also that, um, and I mean, this is conjecture, but I, you know, anecdotally, I've heard this from a lot of people, myself included. When you're exercising, it tends to be a little bit easier to stick to a better diet because you just, 
you feel better overall. <clears throat> you know, psychologically, you might not have the cravings that you normally have for some of the foods that are maybe not so great for you. But then also, you just feel like you're doing such good things for your body. Why would you want to mess that up? Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost like you start to crave the better foods. And um, I just, and I think exercise, it, it is helpful. It may not be, I mean, I think you and I would both agree that diet is probably a much more powerful intervention. Exercise can help as an addition to it. But, I mean, <clears throat> certainly we've, we've read that most people who lose a significant amount of weight and keep the weight off, I mean, that's really the key is, is long-term maintenance of a weight loss. Right. Those people almost all tend to exercise, and they, they credit the exercise with helping them maintain the loss. So whether or not it was all that instrumental in getting the weight off in the first place, the people who do maintain weight loss over the long term, most of them seem to incorporate exercise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. And again, we're going for long-term lifestyle approaches here. And um, that you can certainly, and I've seen this with my clients, lose weight. Or I think even more importantly with diabetics, you can drop your blood sugar fairly you know, significantly with, uh, with diet. But it does, I think, uh, make sense to add the exercise component to it as well. And... Uh, because that has really its own set of benefits. And mm-hmm. and I do think, as you're pointing out, they play into each other. But those and even, in- just, even just getting into the habit, I mean, if you know it's going to be really helpful for maintaining the weight loss, you might as well get started, and that way it's just already part of your life. Mm-hmm. And there are just yeah. so many benefits to movement. Um, I've had a motivation scientist on the podcast couple months ago and really it's becoming more popular to reframe exercise as movement and we can talk a little bit more about that. I just wanted to say too though that um, the high intensity exercise, the research shows when they're measuring blood sugar control that it definitely can help lower blood sugar as well. So that is another effective way of, of lowering blood sugar for people whose obviously their blood sugar is too high to begin with. Mm-hmm. I, I, we should point out though, just so, you know, if, if people out there actually measure their blood glucose, in the acute setting, after a bout of intense exercise, your blood glucose will very likely be elevated. And it won't be dangerously high, but it may have jumped, you know, 10 to 20 points, but that's normal, that is to be expected. When your body is doing this intense activity, your glucose will be higher because it needs to be higher mm-hmm. um, while, while your body's powering through that. But it should, I mean, I'm talking, you know, within within minutes to a half hour after the exercise, and then it'll come down. And, it, you know, as a whole, this type of exercise makes your body more efficient and your glucose will be, you know, just generally lower. But in the acute setting, right after a bout of intense exercise, it will be higher. Right. And I've seen that, and I, I usually advise... My clients just wait you know, wait an hour <laughs> and they'll come back down. Yeah, because you know, then people people who don't understand that that's the body's normal, natural reaction to this type of activity, they you know, oh my god, you know, my blood glucose went up and and they worry or they think it's it's something bad for them and it's it's really not. They just have to understand that's actually the body doing what it's supposed to do under those circumstances. Mhm. So one of the other sort of caveats I want to throw in is just that not all studies that you looked at, Amy, um, show that HIIT was more beneficial than moderate continuous exercise. Do you want to address that? Yeah, I mean, some of them are just, they show basically the same kind of results. There's really not any statistically significant difference. Um, so that doesn't mean that intensity is a work, you know, the high intensity is work, it just means it's no better, which leads us to the conclusion of the, the best exercise for you to do is the one that you prefer, is the one that you actually like. If you, if you like being, you know, on the elliptical machine or out for a job for a long time, if that's your stress relief, or you go outside and you get some nice scenery, you know, by all means, do it. But mm-hmm. if you hate that and you and you don't have time or you don't want to make time, then you know maybe something that that you can do for ten or fifteen minutes a couple of times a week is better. 
Um, so it's kind of like we said earlier, really any type of exercise is good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I can't, yeah, it just it depends on, on what you want to do. And um, I think we, so they did a study in, let's see who it was. It was young women. Um, and they, let's see, what was this? Were they? Four days a week for five weeks. I'm not, if I'm looking at the right study. It was, yeah, obese young women and they did uh, an interval training versus a moderate intensity training. And um, the women, they just, the women in the high intensity are um, enjoy the exercise more. Um, but that's subjective. You know, if you like the, the long or slower stuff, then that's better for you. But they did find that, that the people in the high intensity group had a higher measure of enjoying the exercise. Did it try to get at why that was? I don't think it did. If I don't have a study in front of me, but I, mm-hmm. if I remember right, they didn't really detail what right. it was that they enjoyed about it. I would just think, um, having tried this a few times, is that what makes it kind of interesting is changing things up, the interval piece of it. You're going high, so you're not just kind of frankly letting your mind wander as much or getting bored with it because you're, like I said, you're doing both high and low. You're uh, mixing things up a bit, which just intuitively I think is a little more interesting. Right, yeah, if you get if you get bored with the workout, then to do to do something else. Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's my issue with getting on treadmills and so on, is I, I just find it boring. I have, it's all I can do to just make myself hang in there for 20 minutes or so. And partly why yeah. I stopped doing okay. it. No, I'm just saying what I enjoy more is being outdoors because there are things to look at. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of the opposite. I actually don't mind the long, you know, steady state, but I know that I get better results when I weight train, when I do lifting, and I I don't really enjoy lifting. I kind of have to force myself to do it, but I know I feel better when I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would actually rather get on the bike for, for 20 minutes or even the treadmill for 30 or 40. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I think some it days, out Honestly, some days if I get to the gym at all, I consider it a victory regardless of what I do once I'm actually there. Oh, absolutely. I think we're, the listeners might want to know we're uh, in the middle of winter right now here in the Washington, D.C. area, and it's been very cold um, this past week. So going indoors certainly makes sense, and I, I do use a pool. Um, variety works well for me. So I do lap swimming in the pool, and I, I do every type of uh, stroke that I know, which keeps it interesting as well. Um, but I find after 20 minutes, I'm ready to get out, go to go to the whirlpool. That's frankly my incentive. Is I know I can go in that nice toasty whirlpool, and then the sauna afterwards. So I'm all into rewarding yourself for your effort. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Half the time when I'm working out, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to eat when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, you know, we, so we, we were just talking about mixing things up. Did you want to talk about, you know, Mark Sisson's kind of philosophy, which I really love? Yeah, yeah, this is a good, I think, segue into that. So, go ahead. Oh, okay, I thought you were going to talk about it. But, yeah, Mark Sisson, for, for anyone, I mean, most of the listeners probably know who he is, but he's the guy that runs, uh, you know, the Primal Blueprint, and um, Mark's Daily Apple is his, his website and blog, but... He, he has such a balanced approach to everything, and I, he's one of the few people in the paleo primal world that I've liked from the beginning, and I still really like. You know, he's never been an extremist. He's never been an alarmist. So his position with exercise is mostly to kind of mimic what we believe our ancestors would have done and so what, what the human body might be conditioned to expect and to thrive on, which is a lot of different variety of movements. So there would have been a lot of long walks, you know, while they were gathering, you know, looking for plants, exploring, so lots of long, you know, sort of slow intensity, and and there would have been periods of brief intense activity, like if there was a predator nearby, or they were, you know, maybe... 
Hunting. They were chasing after prey. So there would have been little bouts. Um, there would have been a lot of, you know, maybe some heavy lifting, transporting rocks, transporting who knows what, you know, different materials. Um, so it's a big mix of things. And um, it wouldn't have been the same thing every day at the same time of day even. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to, you know, some people get up every day and they go to the gym at the same time and do the same thing. And, I, you know, any movement is better than no movement, but, you know, mix, mix things up all the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I think there's some research that uh, shows that as well. Um, I think the other interesting thing about Mark Sisson's comment was that sprinting was not a regular activity for our ancestors. So even, you know, the idea that you have to do that every day or even every other day is not what our ancestors were doing naturally. That they were engaged most of the time in more of this low-level exercise, which harks back to that notion of movement. Um, they were just moving a lot more. They were just naturally much more active. Uh, obviously, it was a different time and age um, with the modern conveniences. Mm -hmm. And so just in their natural course of their day, they were just reaching, picking, uh, walking, carrying things. Um, even, you know, a hundred years ago, if you look at farming right. communities, that's what our ancestors were doing, um, you know, pre-industrialization, um, even, you know, not that long ago. So I just find right. this and fascinating. I, I on small farms just for brief periods here and there, and, you know, not not huge, huge pieces of land with tons of, of machinery and equipment, and we were mostly carrying things by hand, you know, carrying huge buckets of feed or walking all over the place to get things done, and I, I probably walked, you know, two or three miles a day just through the course of the farm chores, mm -hmm. you know, not even really trying, just in the course of the day, and even as an office worker, and this is going to, you know, I, I've come to realize how sedentary I am now that I work from home and I I had a, a government job about a year and a half ago that I thought was a sedentary job because it was an office job and I was in front of a computer but I worked in a very large building um, and I you know I had to walk to and from the bus every day and just to get to my office from the main entrance of this building was probably about half a mile mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about the Pentagon, in case anybody's curious. It is a very huge facility. And again, just in the course of, of running my errands or getting chores done or going to coffee, I probably walked two miles without even trying on top of regular workouts. And now that I don't, now that I'm not in that atmosphere, um, I'm, I'm much more sedentary. I have to deliberately tell myself to get up and go for a walk or go move. Otherwise, I could easily sit in my chair all day. Um, so it's, I don't, I don't even want to admit this because I don't want to have to, you know, move a lot more or, or feel guilty about how sedentary I've become, but I have put on some weight, and I don't, I don't think that's the only issue. There's some other factors going on, but even, even before I worked at the Pentagon, when I looked back on previous jobs I've had or just other times in my life, when I was much more active out of necessity, like, for example, before I even owned a car, you know, if you live in, a, in right. certain places, you don't really need a car. You get a lot walking or public transportation. And I was much, much thinner. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, I wasn't even as careful about my diet. So I think there really is something to that just sort of low-level activity that's part of your life without you even having to deliberately make time for it. Well, and I think um, what you're saying points out a couple of things. One is that... Uh, incorporating this into your routine, um, you, there are tricks that you can do, for example, in the workplace, uh, parking further away so you have to walk to the building, uh, walking to meetings, not taking the elevators, walking upstairs. I worked at a large campus in Rockville when I was working at Westat, and those are some of the things I would do. I would just intentionally uh, take the stairs and I was one of the few people who didn't use email to just go talk to my colleagues um, I would go, I would go to their offices instead because I wanted to get up and I don't know if this is 100% accurate but what I've heard is that you should get up every hour just even to walk to the bathroom you know just um, 
just to get up and move a little bit. And I actually brought an exercise ball into my office. I was fortunate I did have my own office, so I could close the door, but I actually sat on it <laughs> in, um, at my desk for a couple hours, and I got found that that kept me, uh, my posture better, it um, toned my abs a little bit, and then when, frankly, I could close the door, I would just kind of spread out on it and stretch out. And luckily, you know, my boss, he didn't care at all. A few times I felt like poking fun at, you know, a situation by jumping up and down on it or something, like romper room. Right. Like, <laughs> uh, just to lighten things up a little bit, but um, I did restrain myself. But, uh, yeah, so there are things that you can do in an office setting um, just to kind of break up that that sitting and it's funny that you're saying that since you're self-employed I can understand your context but mine is different where I actually feel much more the freedom to schedule my time so for me and I am fortunate to live two blocks from the Potomac and one block from the Mount Vernon Trail so I mm -hmm. love just walking literally one block and being on the trail which fronts, fronts the Potomac, so it's very pretty. There's a marina there, there's Dyke Marsh, which is like a bird sanctuary. Um, and it's also, the other thing I was going to say was that I choose a dirt path to jog because um, asphalt and concrete is hard on your joints. You know, no matter what you're doing, it could be basketball or tennis. Um, so anytime you can choose a softer surface um, to do that. So I tried out the high intensity yesterday on my on my jog. And when I'm saying jogging, I'm, I mean jogging, not running. So I had, I, I thought, you know, I'm going to try this out. So I would sprint for about 60 seconds, maybe even a little bit longer, and then slow down and just kind of fast walk. And, and I did that several times, and it actually felt pretty good. I think it's important you just to kind of gauge your fitness level because I cannot I don't see myself running marathons um, I don't think I'm at that point physically but um, but I, I have certainly enough energy to pick up the pace and therefore I sweated which is also a form of detox and helps I think um, boost your endorphins. I mean, there's, there's just benefits to doing that, and I think that improves weight loss as well. So I can pretty much count on that to drop a pound, even two pounds sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sweating is, um, I, I can't say I gauge my effort by whether I'm sweating or not, but I tend to feel better after some type of movement where I did work up a sweat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and I well, think no, the endorphins, sorry, I was just going to say the endorphins, you know, from a mental health point of view, um, for anyone who thinks being self-employed is not stressful, stressful think again. <laughs> <laughs> so I find it's, it's just good uh, maintenance for my mental health as well and a stress reliever. Um, people don't always talk about that, but I think that's another benefit of exercise. And you get your and the high intensity piece would get your endorphins up, so you, it elevates your mood as well. Right. Actually, I mean, I think I'll say something a little bit unpopular. There are people who, you know, sometimes they'll be referred to as exercise bulimics, but I just think it's we can just call it an exercise addict. There are right. people who are addicted is very high intensity activity and I think it could be because that, that may be one of the only places in their life where they get that high, that endorphin rush, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, I mean that's not necessarily a bad thing, I mean there's, there's far worse habits you could have that, that get you that rush, that could really get you into serious, you know, physical or financial trouble, but there is a point of diminishing returns with this, you know, when you exercise really hard, you have to rest hard too, and you have to replenish hard, you know, and that's why I think we have a lot of young people, women specifically, that do intense exercise many times a week and they're chronically under eating. You know, they're really not refueling properly and, and then they run into problems. So, um, you know, like anything, it's, it's a balance. You have to do some, but not too much. Right, and I think um, Chris Kresser actually talked about him adopting um, the high intensity interval training and he says now he only exercises four to nine minutes a week 
and he's wow. incorporated weight training and that that he has uh, reaped the benefits and he thinks his physique is even better now and so on so I'll include his post um, as well as yours Amy in the show notes but I thought that's pretty amazing um, I do spend a lot more time but I also going back to your point I do things like Zumba which is um, to really great Latin music and um, very high energy fast mm -hmm. dance music which I love so that hour just speeds by. I mean, it's amazing how fast it goes because it's... Mm -hmm. And so I, I think going back to your point about enjoying it is really critical because if you're not into cycling or you're not into um, treadmill perhaps, uh, you know, at the end of the day you just want to move and you want to do something that ideally gets your heart rate up too. And Zumba will do that because they're varying the pace and you can just tell by the music they choose um, so but it's, it's having said that it's nice to know that if I don't have the time I can get a good workout and reap similar benefits by doing this high intensity interval training right. so thanks for um, talking about this topic today Amy and where can people find you in your blog post uh, well, the blog post I wrote was for Designs for Health, and they haven't published it yet. I think they'll probably be publishing it sometime this month or next. Um, but my, my blog is at tuitnutrition.com. That's T-U-I-T nutrition.com, and that is the same thing as my website. And if people want to write to me, they can do so through there. That's great. Thank you so much. And next episode, I will have a conversation with Dr. Malal abdel Menek. She's a gastroenterologist and researcher from Duke University to talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that is the most common form of chronic liver disease and it is associated with obesity and type 2 diabetes. So stay tuned for that episode. Be well and have a great week everyone.